thank you for visiting my channel, Homestead in the Woods. I am Catherine, and today is one of those hectic days. I have a lot of stuff going on, and it's feeling a little overwhelming. There's so much that needs to be done, but all I can do is just kind of get in there and start getting it done. So I've got a ton of zucchini. Actually, this was not mine. It was gifted to me by a neighbor, and I try to get my zucchini harvested before it gets to this point but I don't want to waste what I was given either. So I need to spend a little time getting that shredded, make some zucchini bread, put the rest in the freezer. I've also got tomatoes that need harvesting. These are the ones that I picked yesterday before the rain came, but we got about two and a half inches of rain yesterday after having a really dry summer. And so the tomatoes that are currently out in my garden are in very high rate of rupturing because of that sudden influx of water so i do need to get out there and see what's going on and it is a muddy bog but that's the way it is i'm just very concerned that i might lose my tomatoes even the green ones because that sudden influx of water will make them rupture so i've got that going on there's squash that needs to be dealt with in another way so here's some um, winter squash that is ready i've got see a lot of dirt on it still i've got a bunch of that that is just kind of sitting in the garage and that needs to be kind of cleaned up and put away for use later on. Okay, I'm back in from rescuing some of my tomatoes. Um, as you can see, there was some splitting, um, really with just two varieties. Uh, what you see here, where is it? Uh, right here, this is the Black Beauty tomato. Let me get to it. So it had cracked as a result of the rain, so that will get chopped up here real quick. And I also had, um, this is a Brad's co Cosmic, no, Brad's Atomic uh, little cherry type tomato. And um, there were several of those that cracked. So really only two varieties had cracked. The rest of them, they're just ready to be harvested. And so uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought, so I'm certainly grateful for that. also found a tom a uh, zucchini that I had missed yesterday that needed to be harvested and then a, a, a bell pepper back in here. So not bad news, but I do have to go back out then later on this afternoon and check again to make sure there's no tomatoes that are rupturing any more than, than what I've already got. Now I'm going to be moving on to washing these up, chopping them, the ones that aren't going to be used for fresh, and then on to making the zucchini bread. Okay, I'm ready to get going on the zucchini bread. So here is two cups of shredded zucchini, a little bit more, but that's fine. And I've got one cup of finely chopped, it's actually a combination of pecans and walnut, walnuts. The recipe calls for walnuts, but I only had maybe a quarter cup, and so the rest is pecans, and I actually like the flavor of pecans better. Or if in, in the south, I guess it's pecans. So in the bowl here, I've got three cups of flour, one cup of granulated sugar. It's just a natural sugar, it's not a white bleached sugar, that's what I use. And then I've got one and a quarter cups of brown sugar. So I'm just going to use my beater and get this all mixed up. I'm going to try and make, make sure all of the really big lumps of brown sugar are smashed with the back of the spoon. I'm gonna actually do that now. Brown sugar just tends to make lumps, so. Mash it as best I can. I like using a combination of regular sugar and brown sugar. I think the brown sugar just imparts a really nice flavor to zucchini bread. And it also makes it a little bit moister too. So between the two, it's a win-win situation for using some brown sugar. Something sounded odd with my mixer. I hope it's okay. All right, there's still some, some lumps of brown sugar in here, but I'm just going to move on and work on them if they don't uh, kind of dissolve in the batter. Okay, to that mixture, I am adding one teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of baking soda, one tablespoon of cinnamon, and one teaspoon of nutmeg. 
and into the dry stuff it goes. Gotta get it mixed in there too. Alright, the next thing we're going to be putting in is our wet ingredients. And I've got one cup of oil. This is grapeseed oil, but use whatever light flavored oil that you like. I don't like canola oil because it comes from uh, rapeseed, which is almost all GMO, so I don't use it. And I've also got three whole eggs in here as well. And I'm just going to pour it on in. And I've also got a, a, a generous tablespoon of vanilla. And that's pretty much it for our wet ingredients. very dry and very crumbly it almost looks like the topping that you would use you know as a streusel type topping and actually that probably sounds really good but we don't yet have the zucchini in here um, if you have any idea how much water is in zucchini you wouldn't worry about the fact that our batter is actually very crumbly I'm not going to be using this anymore so I'll get it out of the way so from here on out, we're going to just use a spoon. So I've got my two plus cups of shredded zucchini and I've got my one cup of shredded walnuts and pecans. And I'm just gonna mix it all together. So all of that water in the zucchini is going to make this a very moist batter. It's going to make it a moist bread. It's not really even a batter. Not like I think of a batter being you know, like a pancake batter or a muffin or cake batter. This is really quite thick. But that zucchini is going to give off a lot of water. So not too worried. Just need to make sure it's really well incorporated into this sugar flour mixture that we've got here. In the meantime, I've got my oven is heating up to 325 degrees. And that's Fahrenheit. You can see that the zucchini is actually letting loose some of its water now, and this is becoming more batter-like as I stir. Okay, that looks really well incorporated. So now I'm going to get it into the pan. And for that, I just need my nice spatula here. All right, the pans that I'm using, and this is really what I prefer to bake with, these are taller, but not as wide. So I, I really don't care for those, um, like the four by nine pans. I find for making bread, it just makes too big of a piece. So this is what I usually use. I do make gluten-free bread, and this is all I can use when I'm making gluten-free bread because it allows the bread to rise up higher without kind of going over the edges, which is what it does with those um, four, four by nine type. I've also greased it with some butter and laid some parchment in there and that will allow me to just lift the bread up and won't have to try and dig it out in case it decides to get stuck. These pans I got from, um, well it says KAL on here, which is the King Arthur or 
KAF, which is King Arthur Flower. So you can get these pans from King Arthur Flower, their website, and order them. But anyway, that is what I like to use. So look at here. The uh, thing that looked like just a crumbly topping has really become a batter. So I'm going to go ahead and divide that between two pans. Just kind of eyeball it as best you can. Try to make it an even divide. That is for sure somewhat uneven. So I'm just going to get a little out of that one and add it to this side. All right, let's see what we got here. Yeah, a little bit more. That's close enough. Slapped, oh, slapped a little bit over there on the side, but that's all right. It will clean up later. All right, my pan is pre my oven is preheated, so I'm going to go ahead and get these into the oven. So as soon as I get that uh, zucchini bread out of the oven and it has a chance to cool, we got to do a taste test, right? So I'll be back in a few minutes as soon as I get the zucchini bread out. I might need more than one piece to taste. To taste. All right, I guess it's good, huh? It is better than good. Okay then. Thank you for your taste test. You're welcome. You can have the other loaf. Before I chopped up all of these beautiful tomatoes, I thought it would be interesting to show you what they are. This particular one is called a Black Beauty. And the, the top here is purple. I mean, it's almost black. When the sun is bright and shining, it really does look black. And when it's mature, you know it's ready because the bottom of it turns them this mahogany color. So this is absolutely beautiful tomato. And when you cut it open, it's sort of a, a greenish purple on the inside and very, very delicious. This one is a Cherokee purple tomato. And I'm not quite sure why they call it purple the only purple on it really is right in here and it's more of a green to my eye but anyway it also turns more of a mahogany color when it's ripe and these are san san marzano tomatoes and these are tomatoes that are used primarily for making tomato sauce and tomato paste they're a very meaty tomato not a lot of of liquid in it and this one here is a basic slicing tomato. This is about average size for them. And this is a celebrity type tomato. That's the name of this one. It's celebrity. And these two little cherry size tomatoes, this variety is bumblebee. And that's a very um, sweet tomato. I would say it's not uh, a tart one like some of the green ones are. Or one, some of the red ones are. I was looking at these and I said green. So these little tomatoes are called Brad's Atomic Tomatoes and they pretty much stay green. Um, earlier on, they took on more of purple on the tops, but as they ripen, they become more green. And I'm hoping that you can see that as I turn them, you can see stripes of almost fluorescent color in them. I mean, hopefully you can see that green with a, a fluorescent streaks in it, sort of a reddish, yellowish streaks. And lastly, these two beauties are called green zebra tomatoes, and these are slicing tomatoes that have kind of a, a citrusy taste, but they are green until they ripen 
and then they start getting the, the yellow in there. But they're absolutely beautiful, and they're very tasty, uh, sliced up into salad, almost a citrusy taste to them. So that's the tomatoes I'm working with uh, today, and they will all go into the same jars, all one happy tomato family in my canning jars, and they will be absolutely delicious. I actually prefer mixes of tomatoes like this for my tomato sauce and, and spaghetti sauces and things that I'm going to use it in. It just makes it more interesting. I've got all of those tomatoes chopped up and they're in the stock pot and now I'm going to put the lid on it and take it down to the refrigerator until I can bring it up and boil it down for canning. Good evening friends and it's been a long day. We're getting ready to settle in for the night but before I do I need to get my yogurt going and I do have an instant pot that I'm going to be making my yogurt in. It takes eight hours so when you're selling in for the night, that's really the best time to get that going. So I am going to be using organic grass fed, 100% whole milk for this process. So at this point, I'm going to turn the camera over to the counter here so you can see the Instant Pot. Super easy to do your own beautiful yogurt, good probiotics. It's just so much better than store-bought and much less expensive as well. So I'm gonna turn the camera around so you can see how it gets started and then we'll finish that up in the morning. Okay, I've got my Instant Pot on, and my goodness, why is that tight? All right, I've already got my milk opened up here. This is a full half gallon of milk. It's gonna go into the Instant Pot. I've had it out on the counter for a couple of hours just to come to room temperature. It just will uh, start becoming yogurt that much faster if it's not cold, cold from the refrigerator. Okay, two ingredients. So the next thing is a little bit of yogurt left over from the last batch. That's kind of a rounded half cup of good whole milk, probiotic rich, plain yogurt. You don't ever want to make yogurt with sweeteners or flavors or anything like that to start off with when you're making yogurt. It's just make it plain. And then after it's done, you can add the flavorings that you want. All right, I'm just gonna mix that in with the whisk. You do wanna make sure that that yogurt that you put in is thoroughly incorporated into the milk so that you don't have any uneven uh, coagulation going on in there. So think of that yogurt as like a starter would be for sourdough bread. That starter is extremely important and necessary to make this yogurt at home. All right, that is pretty much it. I'm going to put the top on it. Very simple process here. We're going to push the yogurt button. And it already knows that I've made this before and I'm going to have it eight hours. If I wanted to increase it, it goes by 30 minute increments, but eight hours has worked well for me. The longer it cooks, the tangier it, become, tangier it becomes. So it's set for eight hours right now and I'm going to hit the start button and that's it. So it's going to go through a preheating and it, then it will um, go ahead and stay warm for those eight hours and then it will keep it warm at a lower temperature for the remaining time until I come and take it out of here. So at this point, it's gonna be going all night and I'm going to go turn in for the night myself. So I'll be back with you and show you how this looks in the morning. We're going to be straining it uh, in the morning and then putting it back in the refrigerator to finish straining. Well, good morning. It is the next morning and it's taking me a total of three days to get all of this filming done because there's so much going on. I need to strain that yogurt that I got going in my Instant Pot last night. Now there's not a lot I'm going to be doing with it until tomorrow, but I have to get it out of the Instant Pot and get it into the strainer and then back into the refrigerator downstairs. 
Okay, I just took the top off the Instant Pot and I'm just going to show you, this looks absolutely perfect, how thick this yogurt is now. As thick as that is, it's still not thick enough to be of a Greek yogurt consistency, so that's why I'm going to strain it. This is totally usable right now, and it's nice and tangy. I'm going to actually give it a taste, but it's still pretty loose. Mm. It tastes really good, but I'm going to turn the camera back around and show how I strain it. Like this is what I use to strain the yogurt when I make it. It's really just a, a pasta making pot and the, the pasta part of it normally would be uh, down in here and you cook the pasta and then you strain it. But it also comes with this little smaller um, container for steaming things and that is the perfect size for this yogurt. So I'm going to be using a cheese strainer. Um, this is purchasable on Amazon and I'm just going to tuck it down into the pot. Fortunately this happens so very quickly that I can get that off of my to-do list really fast. So this actually would go all the way down into the pot if need be but it doesn't need to be that way so that's pretty much what I'm going to do. Try to get a few few less folds in here, but anyway, it can actually hold quite a bit of, of cheese making ingredients. And the yogurt just pretty much just kind of rolls down in there. So you can probably see some of the whey dripping through as I started to pour it. That's it. So all of this liquidy stuff, the clear liquid, that is whey. And that is what's going to be left in the bottom after it's strained, and it will be about a quart of whey uh, by tomorrow morning. And if I want it even thicker, I just leave it in the strainer longer. And you know, sometimes I don't get it for to get back to it for two days, and it's even thicker, and there's even more whey. But out of this half gallon of milk, I can expect to get half gallon of yogurt and a half gallon of whey, but that's going to be tomorrow or the following day, and I'll show you how that all looks. So that's it for the yogurt for today, and I'm going to take this downstairs to my extra refrigerator, keep it chilled, and we move on to the next thing. All right, I have put the yogurt down in the refrigerator, and now I've got the tomatoes that I chopped up the other day, and those are now going to go onto the burner. Okay, I've put these tomatoes on a medium-high. They are beautiful and colorful, but it's going to take a little while to get these cooked down. So in the meantime, I'm going to get my water bath canner ready. But I just want to mention that, no, I did not take the skins off of these, and no, I did not take the seeds out either. I'm just going to use them as they are before I make the dishes that I will probably make with these. I will most likely put these to cooked tomatoes from the can. Once, they, once they've been canned, I will use them to make sauces and things that I'll put in my Vitamix and pulverize everything before I make the dish, so I'm not going to worry about it. The skins actually provide lots of fiber, and in my opinion, it does not make the sauce bitter at all. I mean, think about it, when you eat a tomato, the skin's not bitter, so why would it become bitter when you're making a sauce? So I don't think that's the case. But one of the reasons that I don't always take the skins and seeds off is because these particular tomatoes were heirloom tomatoes and they were lots of ruffles and ridges and it would have been extremely difficult to get the skins off of some of those. So rather than fight with that, I'm just going to cook as it is and it will make a fine um, canned tomato for use later on. So I've got this on a medium high heat and I'm just gonna come in and stir it every once in a while just to make sure that nothing is sticking or burning on the bottom, but it's starting to smell very tomato-y in the kitchen already, so We'll just keep going. As you can see, the tomatoes are already giving off 
a lot of liquid. Not fully heated through yet. When I can stir this and it remains boiling while I'm stirring it, then I know it's a good time to start canning. But we're not there yet. We're getting close on the tomatoes being ready for canning. Well, look at all of the liquid. I did not add any water to it. This is just how much liquid was in those tomatoes. Getting the canner ready, so we'll be canning soon. Okay, I'd say we are ready to rumble on these tomatoes. So I'm going to turn the heat off and move it over to my canning station where we'll get these bad boys canned. So I actually decided that I'm going to be water, not water bath canning these, but I'm going to pressure can these. And the real simple reason is because I couldn't even get hold of my water bath canner. We've got some rearranging going on downstairs and I just couldn't even get to it without moving a bunch of other stuff. So I could use this water bath, uh, this pressure canner for doing a water bath. But when you add the weight of this canner, which is very heavy, with all of the water that would need to be in there, I just can't even handle it. So I'm just gonna go on ahead and pressure can these according to um, standard pressure canning practice for canned, canning tomatoes. All right, time to can. So th this doesn't make a lot of sense to me and maybe it will to you, maybe it won't. And if you happen to know why this is, then please, uh, make a comment down below, but the reason you need to increase the acidity for tomatoes when you're going to be water bath canning is just that very thing. You're water bath canning and foods have to be a certain level of acid to be water bath canned. However, the pressure canning recipe in the ball canning book also calls for using lemon juice to increase the acidity for the tomatoes to pressure can. Now you don't put lemon juice in to increase the acidity of meat when you pressure can it. So why do you have to do it for tomatoes? That's my question. I'm gonna do it anyway because the Ball Book of Preservation says so, but that's a good question. So I've got my jars in here, they're nice and hot. The level of water in this canner is already fine, so I am just going to dump the water that's in these jars out in the sink. You only want a couple of inches of water in your pressure canner. It doesn't go over the tops of the jars like it does for water bath canning. And I'm just going to put one spoon of tomato in first. Let's see if I can get this closer. No. Nope. Um, and then I'm going to put in my juice because I did not want this cold juice to cause thermal shock to the jar. So for each pint jar, it's one tablespoon of lemon juice. For quarts, it's two tables of lemon, tablespoons of lemon juice, but I am using pints today, so it's one tablespoon. I was thinking about doing quarts for this recipe, but I decided that with just the two of us, mostly I use the uh, pint size jars. So that's what I am doing. Just making sure there's no air bubbles in here. For this recipe, it requires one inch of head space, and that's about right just to the rim of this jar. I'm now taking my vinegar and wiping off the jar. You do that with every single one you put in to the canner to make sure that there's no stickiness, no vegetable residue, no anything that's going to get in between the lid of that jar and this seal. It absolutely, positively must be properly uh, sealed in order to get a good seal in the canner. The water in here is hot. The tomatoes are hot. The jars are hot. <laughs>
Okay, here's my canner. And the way this lid goes on, there's no rubber gaskets, anything like that in these. It's just metal on metal, and there is a little bit of, it's already on here, a little bit of oil on here so that when it goes down, it doesn't get same kind of stuck. All right, this gauge always goes forward. These two labels always go forward. And I'm going to set this down, and you'll notice there's a groove in the base and a, an arrow here. And when I put this down, my goal is to get these little latches, and there's one, two, three, four, five of them. Um, well, maybe not three. Those are going to, there we go, latch in all the way around in three places. One there, one here, and one on the other side. So that is firmly down. And the arrow lines up with this mark on the base. I've got the key turned up again, and I'm closing, let me adjust the camera a wee bit more here. You can see all the canning debris in the background, the boxes, the jars, and various other things. Ugh, it doesn't want to stay in place. It's being stubborn. All right, so I'm going to show this again. There's opposite latches. You bring it up and just barely finger tight. Bring the next two up, finger tight. Next two up, and finger, and finger tight. What you don't want to do is just ratchet them down um, in separate areas. You want to do each side the same at the same time. So put this back on here. So just you know, tight enough. You don't want to ratchet it down so that you need a hydraulic wrench to undo it. That's all you need to do. So, I've got a gauge here, but I've also got a vent that's going to have a weighted device on it. And this device, I'm starting to go into the whole spiel here, it has weights of 5, 10, and 15. And depending on where you put it, it exerts that much pressure. So, for our elevation, we are going to be using 10 pounds of pressure for 10 minutes of processing time. So, see, I don't know if you just saw that little bit of water coming up through the spout. We're going to let this vent, and I'll show you when that starts, for 10 minutes, and then we'll put the vent on. So, even though it's only 10 minutes for pressure canning, and it's also 10 minutes for water bath canning, there's a lot of steps with pressure canning that you just have to go through. So, I will come back when this is venting so you can see what that looks like. All right, there's some steam that is starting to come out, and I'm going to put my hot pad here so you can kind of see it. Um, yes, there's steam coming out, but it's kind of tenuous. It's not a continuous stream yet, but we're very, very close. In just about a minute, we're going to be able to start timing 10 minutes, and then we put the weight on it. All right, the steam is going pretty continuous now. I think you can see that right here. So I'm going to apply the vent, I'm sorry, I'm going to apply the weight to the vent. So I'm going to put it on the, I don't know if you can see, it says 10 here, so that's 10 pounds of pressure, and on it goes. I see some people do that with their hands, and I just, I can't bring myself to do it because I'd probably get burned by that steam, so tongs again, very helpful to have. So I'm going to wait now until this is jiggling at uh, about four jiggles per minute and that's when I will start my 10 minutes of timing and by that time this gauge will have come up to the 10 pounds of pressure mark okay the weight has started jiggling I'm just gonna watch it for about a minute and see how many times per minute it's doing that I did turn the heat down a little bit I've got the heat turned down to about what I'm used to using for working with this particular pressure canner to get that to go do that about once uh, every 15 seconds or four times in a minute. So my gas is on, it's between the medium high and high, but it's closer to the medium high.
All right, that actually looks about right. So I'm gonna put 10 minutes on my timer. From the moment you get that to jiggling, about four times a minute, that's when the 10 minutes start. So my timer's on, and I'll come back when this is finished. We hit the 10 minute mark, and so I'm going to be turning the water off. And we're gonna let that set until there's no more pressure left. So it's at 10 pounds right now, and we're going to wait until the pressure is all the way down to zero before trying to take that knob off. So I will be back when we get to that point. All right, the pressure is down and I've taken the weight off and it's now safe to take this open. And as you put it on, you also take across from each other and undo it. All right. When you open it up, make sure that you open it up away from you because that steam is hot. Okay. So I'm going to pull everything out of the canner and place it here. There's no drafts, no fans, no open windows, anything that will cause the jars to shatter. But I am going to put a cloth here. So I can see, uh, of the five jars on the top here, I can see one is not yet sealed, the other four have. That's not unusual. So as I take it out of the canner, you can kind of see some bubbles that are coming up from the bottom, totally normal. I especially see that when I've got any kind of broth that I'm doing. Just try to keep it as upright as you can. And this is the one that has not yet sealed. That doesn't mean anything. It probably will while we're doing this. So, take out the divider. Put that over here on the drying rack. It doesn't appear that there's been any siphoning of, well you can really see that one, bubbling. And I've said it before, but uh, siphoning is when the fluid comes out of the jars and escapes into the water and you can see it by the change in color of the water. I don't see any red tinge to it that it would indicate to me that there's been any siphoning. So we had a successful canning, at least from that perspective. No loss of liquid from the jars is a good thing. still watching that one jar right here it has not yet that little dimple on the top has not yet gone inward so I will continue to watch that particular one so I'm just gonna let these sit here for a while and kind of finish doing what they're doing and once they've cooled off I'll move them over to another place on the counter but they'll be out of the way and they need to stay there for 24 hours so my successful canning, 13 pints of canned tomatoes. So that is it. Um, I'll do one more segment to this video before it ends, and that's when I take the yogurt out of the refrigerator and put it into a container after it's strained. And I will see you at that time. Here's my yogurt. And this is a little more than 24 hours of straining. It's nice and thick. Uh, this is the spoon I'm gonna be scooping it out with, but just so that you can see how thick that is. Really nice, thick yogurt. It's really good with honey and some fruit, some berry sauces poured on it, um, granola. It's just delicious. 
and let me just pull this up real quick so you can see how much of the half gallon of milk when strained then becomes whey. Get this up here. So, I don't know if, how much you can see here, but that's quite a bit of whey. I'm going to put the yogurt and the whey in quart jars, and then I'll show you the final product. Okay, we're ready to conclude this video. And so, we covered zucchini bread. As you can see, this loaf has been severely diminished. It was that tasty. We canned tomatoes. And we also made delicious homemade yogurt. And that is a half gallon of whole grass-fed milk. This is a, a quart of really tasty yogurt. And I also got a quart of whey, which is usable for many other products. I'm probably going to make some bread with this later on this week. But one of the last things I want to mention is in the instructions that I gave for making this yogurt, I said to use about a half cup of your prior unflavored yogurt as the starter for the next one. Well, for your first batch, you're not going to have any leftover starter, so you need to use a good quality Greek whole, plain, non-fat yogurt, grass-fed hopefully, but good quality yogurt with probiotics in it, live cultures. You need the live culture. So if you don't have any of your own yogurt to use for the next batch, then for sure. And I certainly do recommend this one because that's what I started my first batch on. So that will end this video. I want to thank you for joining me on this rather diverse video this time. And if you haven't done so already, please uh, subscribe to the channel and hit that thumbs up button to like it. And after you do, after you subscribe, you'll have an opportunity for notifications and click on that little bell and choose all. And then you'll be notified anytime I post a new video. So thank you for coming and welcome back to Homestead in the Woods and we'll see you on the next video.